My name is John. You've already heard from my dear friend and brother Peter. Like him, I'm a fisherman working for my dad Zebedee in the family-run fishing business in Galilee. Jesus called me and my brother James to follow him. He nicknamed me and my brother the Sons of Thunder, as we could be a little fiery at times. Us, along with Peter, became the closest to Jesus among the 12 disciples. Some say I was the closest to Jesus. I don't know about that, but I know that he loved me. At the final Passover, Jesus taught us many things once the traitor Judas had left the room. Jesus said, if you love me, obey my commandments and I will ask the Father and he will give you another advocate who, you, who will never leave you. He is the Holy Spirit who leads into all truth. The world cannot receive him because it isn't looking for him and doesn't recognize him. But you know him because he lives with you now and later will be in you. No, I will not abandon you as orphans. I will come to you. Soon the world will no longer see me, but you will see me. Since I live, you also will live. When I am raised to life again, you will know that I am in my Father and you are in me and I am in you. Those who accept my commandments and obey them are the ones who love me. And because they love me, my Father will love them and I will love them and reveal myself to each of them. Jesus went on to say that he was the true vine. He said, yes, I am the vine. You are the branches. Those who remain in me and I in them will produce much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Jesus also warned us. He said, if the world hates you, remember that it hated me first. The world would love you as one of its own if you belong to it, but you are no longer part of the world. I chose you to come out of the world, so it hates you. But I will send you the advocate, the spirit of truth. He will come to you from the Father and will testify all about me. And you must also testify about me because you have been with me from the beginning of my ministry. Jesus said, now I am going away to the one who sent me and not one of you is asking where I am going. Instead, you grieve because of what I have told you. But in fact, it is best for you that I go away because if I don't, the advocate won't come. If I do go away, then I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will convict the world of its sin and of God's righteousness and of the coming judgment. The world's sin is that it refuses to believe in me. Righteousness is available because I go to the Father and you will see me no more. Judgment will come because the ruler of this world has already been judged. Jesus said, there is so much more I want to tell you, but you can't bear it now. When the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on his own, but will tell you what he has heard. He will tell you about the future. He will bring me glory by telling you whatever he receives from me. All that belongs to the Father is mine. This is why I said, the Spirit will tell you whatever he receives from me. Jesus then looked up to heaven and prayed to the Father that he would keep us and make us one. After saying these things, Jesus crossed the Kidron Valley with us and entered a grove of olive trees. Judas, the betrayer, knew this place because Jesus has often gone there with us. The leading priests and Pharisees had given Judas a contingent of Roman soldiers and temple guards to accompany him. Now with blazing torches, lanterns and weapons, they arrived at the olive grove. Jesus fully realized all that was going to happen to him. So he stepped forward to meet them. Who are you looking for? He asked. Jesus, the Nazarene, they replied. I am he, Jesus said. Jesus, who betrayed him, was standing with them. As Jesus said, I am he, they all drew back and fell to the ground. Once more he asked them, who are you looking for? And again, they replied, Jesus, the Nazarene. 
I told you that I am he, Jesus said. And since I am the one you want, let these others go. So the soldiers, their commanding officer and the temple guards arrested Jesus and tied him up. First they took him to Annas, since he was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, the high priest at that time. Caiaphas was the one who had told the other Jewish leaders, it's better that one man should die for the people. Me and Simon Peter followed Jesus. I was acquainted with the high priest, so I was allowed to enter the high priest's courtyard with Jesus. Peter had to stay outside the gate. Then I spoke to the woman, watching at the gate, and she let Peter in. Jesus endured so much injustice that night at the hands of the leaders and, and the next day from Pilate, the Roman governor, Herod and their soldiers. I followed to the foot of the cross with Mary, his mother. He entrusted her to my care. You've already heard from Peter that early on Sunday morning, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and found that the stone had been rolled away from the entrance. She ran and found Simon Peter and me. She said, they have taken the Lord's body out of the tomb and we don't know where they have put him. Peter and I started out for the tomb. We were both running, but I outran Peter and reached the tomb first. I stooped and looked in and saw the linen wrappings lying there, but I didn't go in. Then Simon Peter arrived and went inside. He also noticed the linen wrappings lying there while the cloth that had covered Jesus' head was folded up and lying apart from the other wrappings. Then I also went in and I saw and believed. For until then, I still hadn't understood the scriptures that said Jesus must rise from the dead. Then we went home. Sometime later, we spent time with the risen Lord on the shores of Galilee he spent some time restoring Peter to serve him. Then Peter turned around and saw me behind them. Peter asked Jesus, what about him, Lord? Jesus replied, if I want him to remain alive until I return, what is that to you? As for you, follow me. So the rumour spread among the community of believers that I wouldn't die. But that isn't what Jesus said at all. He only said, if I want him, to remain alive until I return. What is that to you? This is all my first-hand account. Trust me, I was there. Jesus also did many other things. If they were all written down, I suppose the whole world could not contain the books that would be written. My lesson for you this Passover is to stay close to Jesus. If you listen to God, the Holy Spirit, as he said, you will be guided in the truth of God's word found in the Bible. My name is Mary from Magdala. People call me Mary Magdalene. I too was one of Jesus' closest disciples. I watched in horror as they tortured our Lord. I was standing outside the tomb crying and as I wept, I stooped and looked in. I saw two white robed angels, one sitting at the head and the other at the foot of the place where the body of Jesus had been lying. Dear woman, why are you crying? The angels ask me. Because they have taken away my Lord, I replied, and I don't know where they've put him. I turned to leave and saw someone standing there. It was Jesus, but I didn't recognize him. Dear woman, why are you crying? Jesus asked me. Who are you looking for? I thought he was the gardener. Sir, I said, if you have taken him away, tell me where you have put him and I will get him. Mary, Jesus said. I turned to him and cried out, Rabboni, which is Hebrew for teacher. Don't cling to me, Jesus said, for I haven't yet ascended to the Father, 
but go, find my brothers and tell them, I am ascending to my father and your father, to my God and your God. I found the disciples and told them, I have seen the Lord. And then I gave them his message. My lesson this Passover is that Jesus has risen from the dead. I was the first to bring that good news. Now you can spread the good news too. Sin and death has been defeated by Jesus. Hallelujah. They say this mountain can be They say the chains will never break But they don't know you like we do There is power in your name We've heard that there is no way through We've heard the tide will
one of the millions of angels from God's presence. I was there watching from heaven as God the Son became human, the God-man on God's mission to save humanity. We angels could not believe our eyes. Only our holy duty to only do God's will kept us from storming Jerusalem and getting Jesus out of there as Jesus said in the garden. Don't you realize I could ask my father for thousands of angels to protect us and he would send them instantly. But if I do, how would the scriptures be fulfilled that describe what must happen now? Earlier that same evening, I was sent by God the Father to minister to Jesus when he prayed these words in the garden. Father, if you are willing, please take this cup of suffering away from me yet not what I want, but let your will be done. It was then I appeared from heaven and strengthened him. He prayed more fervently, and it was in such agony of spirit that his sweat fell to the ground like great drops of blood. I also had the great honour of being assigned a mission on that first resurrection morning. Early on Sunday morning, as a new day was dawning, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went out to visit the tomb. Suddenly, there was a great earthquake. Because as an angel of the Lord, I came down from heaven, rolled aside the stone and sat on it. My face shone like a bright morning sun and my clothing was as white as snow. The guards shook with fear and when they saw me, they fell dead faint. Then I spoke to the women. Don't be afraid, I said to them. I know you're looking for Jesus, who was crucified. He isn't here. He is risen from the dead, just as he said would happen. Come and see where his body was laying, and now go quickly and tell the disciples that he has risen from the dead. And he is going ahead of you to Galilee, you will see him there, remember what I've told you. 
The women ran quickly from the tomb. They were very frightened, but also filled with great joy. And they rushed to the give the disciples my important message. And as they went, Jesus met them and greeted them. And they ran to him, grasped his feet and worshiped him. Then Jesus said to them, don't be afraid. Go tell my brothers to leave for Galilee and they will see me there. My lesson for you this Passover is to wait for the go ahead from God before you do anything significant. He has a plan and he always wins. I am Caiaphas, the high priest in Jerusalem. It all started with this Lazarus incident. It was, it was reported to me that Jesus said, didn't I tell you that you would see God's glory if you believe? So they rolled the stone aside. Then Jesus looked up to heaven and said, Father, thank you for hearing me. You always hear me, but I said it out loud for the sake of all these people standing here so that they will believe you sent me. Then Jesus shouted, Lazarus, come out. And the dead man came out, his hands, feet and bound in grave cloths his face wrapped in headcloth. Jesus told them, unwrap him and let him go. Many of the people who were with Mary, Lazarus's sister, believed in Jesus when they saw this happen. But some went to the Pharisees and told them what Jesus had done. Then the leading priests and Pharisees called the high council together. What are we going to do? We asked each other. This man certainly performs many miraculous signs. If we allow him to go on like this, soon everyone will believe in him. Then the Roman army will come and destroy both our temple and our nation. I said, you don't know what you're talking about. You don't realise that it's better for you that one man should die for the people than for the whole nation to be destroyed. I did not say this on my own. As high priest at the time, I was led to prophesy that Jesus would die for the entire nation and not only for that nation, but to bring together and unite all the children of God scattered around the world. So from that time on, we began to plot Jesus' death. And as a result, Jesus stopped his public ministry among the people and left Jerusalem. He went to a place near the wilderness to the village of Ephraim and stayed there with his disciples. Then Judas Iscariot, one of the 12 disciples came to us and asked, how will you pay me to betray Jesus to you? And we gave him 30 pieces of silver. From that time on, Judas began to look for an opportunity to betray Jesus. Well, the trap worked perfectly. Then the people who had arrested Jesus led him to my home, where the teachers of religious law and the elders had gathered. Meanwhile, it was reported to me, Peter followed him at a distance and came to my courtyard. He came in and sat with the guards and waited to see how it would all end. Inside, myself, the leading priests and the entire council were trying to find witnesses who would lie about Jesus so they could put him to death. But even though we found many who agreed to give false witness, we could not use anyone's testimony. Finally, two men came forward who declared, this man said, I am to destroy the temple of God and rebuild it in three days. Then I stood up before the others and asked Jesus, well, aren't you going to answer for these charges? What do you have to say to yourself? But Jesus was silent and made no reply. Then I asked him, are you the Messiah, the son of the blessed one? Jesus said, I am. And you will see me, the son of man, seated in the place of power at God's right hand and coming on the clouds of heaven. Then I tore my clothing to show my horror and said, why do we need other witnesses? You have heard all his blasphemy. What verdict, what is your verdict? Guilty, they all cried. He deserves to die. Then some of us began to spit at him and we blindfolded him and beat him with our fists. Prophe prophesy to us, we jeered. And the guards slapped him as they took him away. Judas came back and was having a guilty conscience. 
He threw the coins we paid him down in the temple. We picked up the coins. It wouldn't be right to put this money in the temple treasury, we said, since it was payment for murder. After some discussion, we finally decided to buy the potter's field and we made it into a cemetery for foreigners. This is why the field is still called the Field of Blood. Very early in the morning, we met to discuss our next step. We bound Jesus, led him away and took him to Pilate, the Roman governor. We accused him of many things and he was abused and mocked by Pilate and Herod's men. Would you like me to release you to this? King of Jews, Pilate asked, for he realised by now that we had arrested Jesus out of envy. But at this point, we stirred up the crowd to demand the release of Barabbas instead of Jesus. Pilate asked us, then what should I do with this man you call the King of the Jews? We shouted back, crucify him, and we got our way. Pilate posted a sign on the cross that read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. The place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and the sign was written in Hebrew, Latin and Greek so that many people could read it. Then we objected and said to Pilate, change it from the King of the Jews to he said, I am the King of the Jews. But Pilate replied, no, what I have written, I have written. We also mocked Jesus. He saved others, we scoffed, but he can't save himself. So is he the King of Israel, is he? Let him come down from the cross right now and we will believe in him. He trusted God. So let God rescue him now, if he wants him. For he said, I am the son of God. Even the revolutionaries who were crucified with him ridiculed him in the same way. At noon, darkness fell across the whole land until three o'clock. At about three o'clock, Jesus called out with a loud voice, Eli, Eli, Lima, Sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you abandoned me? Some of the bystanders misunderstood and thought he was calling for the prophet Elijah. One of them ran and filled a sponge with sour wine, holding it up to him on the reed stick so he could drink. But we said, wait, let's see whether Elijah comes to save him. Then Jesus shouted out again and he released his spirit. At that moment, the curtain in the sanctuary of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook, rocks split apart, and tombs opened. The next day on the Sabbath, we went to Pilate. We told him, Sir, remember what that deceiver once said while he was still alive? After three days, I will rise from the dead, so we request that you seal the tomb until the third day. This will prevent his disciples from coming and stealing his body and telling everyone he was raised from the dead. If that happens, we'll be worse off than we were at the first. Pilate replied, take guards and secure it the best you can. So they sealed the tomb and posted guards to protect it. Then the unthinkable happened. He rose again. Some of the guards came into the city and told us what had happened. A meeting with the elders was called and we decided to give the soldiers a large bribe. We told the soldiers, you must say, Jesus is the disciples came during the night while we were sleeping and they stole his body. If the governor hears about it, we'll stand up for you so you won't get in trouble. So the guards accepted the bribe and said what they were told to say. Their story spread widely among the Jews and they still tell it today. My lesson this Passover is that you cannot suppress or stop the truth. It will find the light of day Jesus is truly the Messiah for the Jewish people and the whole world. I was working in Caiaphas, the high priest's courtyard, but this night was not like any other night. Wow, it was all kicking off. I heard they had hunted down a man named Jesus, who from what I heard from the girls, is a good man, working amazing miracles and helping the people. Well, the word is they want to get rid of him because he threatens their power. I mean, look at this place, they are living off us. When they arrested Jesus, they led him to the high priest's home and Peter followed at a distance. The guards lit a fire in the middle of the courtyard and sat around it. 
and Peter joined them there. I noticed him in the firelight and began staring at him. Finally, I said, this man was one of Jesus' followers, but Peter denied it. Woman, he said, I don't even know him. After a while, someone else looked at him and said, you must be one of them. No man, I'm not, Peter retorted. After an hour later, someone else insisted, this must be one of them because he is a Galilean too. But Peter, Peter said, man, I don't know what you are talking about. And immediately, while he was still speaking, the rooster crowed. My lesson for you this Passover is, do not deny who you are as a Jesus follower. Others are watching you. Keep your head up.
I'm a Roman officer on duty at the Passover in Jerusalem when Jesus was killed. So to pacify the crowd, Pilate was released Barabbas to them. He ordered Jesus flogged with a lead-tipped whip. Some people would die from the beating, it was that severe. Then turned him over to us to be crucified. We took Jesus into the courtyard of the governor's headquarters, called a praetorium, and called out with the entire regiment. We dressed him in a purple robe and we wove thorn branches into a crowd and put them on his head. Then we saluted him and taunted, Hail, King of the Jews! We struck him on the head with reed sticks, spat on him, dropped to our knees in mock worship. When we were finally tired of mocking him, we took off the purple robe and put his own clothes on him again. Then we led him away to be crucified. A passerby called Simon, who was from Cyrene, was coming from the countryside. Just then, we forced him to carry Jesus' cross. He brought Jesus to a place called Golgotha, which means place of the skull. We offered wine drugged with myrrh, but he refused it. Then we nailed him to the cross. We divided his clothes and threw dice to decide who would get each piece. It was nine o'clock in the morning when we crucified him. We also took his robe, but it was seamless, woven with one piece from top to bottom. We said, rather than tearing it apart, let's throw dice for it. Then we sat around and kept guard as they hung him on the tree. Then Jesus uttered another loud cry and breathed his last. And the curtain in the sanctuary of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. I was facing him when I saw how he died. I exclaimed, this man truly is the son of God. It was a day of preparation and the Jewish leaders didn't want to see the bodies hanging there the next day, which was the Sabbath. And a very special Sabbath because it was the Passover week. So they asked Pilate to hasten their death by ordering their legs to be broken. Then their bodies would be taken down. So he came and broke the legs of the two men crucified with Jesus. But when we came to Jesus, we saw he was already dead. So we didn't break his legs. However, his side, I pierced with a spear and immediately water and blood flowed out. This report from me, as an eyewitness, given an accurate account, I speak the truth so that you also may continue to believe. These things happened in fulfillment of the scripture that say, not one of his bones will be broken, and they will look upon the one who they pierced. My lesson to you this Passover is not to let duty and expectation of people around you stop you from seeing Jesus for who he really is, the son of the living God. My name is Tom, also known as Doubting Thomas, nicknamed the Twin. I was one of the original 12 disciples of Jesus. At the last Passover meal with Jesus, he said, do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God and trust also in me. There is more than enough room in my father's home. If this were not so, would I have told you that I'm going to prepare a place for you? When everything is ready, I will come and get you so that you will always be with me where I am and you know the way to where I'm going. No, we don't, I said to the Lord. We have no idea where you're going, so how can we know the way? Jesus told me, I am the way, the truth and the life. No one can come to the Father except through me. If you'd already known me, you'd know who my father is. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. After Jesus rose from the dead, I wasn't with the others. 
and when, they came, when he came. They told me, we have seen the Lord. But I replied, I wouldn't believe it unless I see the nail wounds in his hands, put my finger into them and place my hand in, on the wound on his side. Eight days later, the disciples were together again. This time I was with them. The doors were locked, but suddenly, as before, Jesus was standing amongst us. Peace we with you, he said. And then he said to me, put your finger here. Look at my hand. Put your hand into the wound on my side. Don't be faithless any longer. Believe. My Lord, my God, I exclaimed. Then Jesus told me, you believe because you have seen me. Blessed are those who believe without seeing me. My lesson for you this Passover is to believe. Take God at his word. Jesus fully rose from the dead. I mean, a full body resurrection and will never die again. I saw the wounds myself. You're blessed if you believe the good news about Jesus and his resurrection. Hi, I'm Klopas. I am one of Jesus' followers and I have an amazing story to tell. As I was walking with my friend to the village of Emmaus, seven miles from Jerusalem, as we walked along, we were talking about everything that had happened. As we talked and discussed these things, Jesus himself suddenly came and began walking with us. But God kept us from recognising him. He asked us, what are you discussing so intently as you walk along? We stopped short, sadness written across our faces. Then I replied, you must be the only person in Jerusalem who hasn't heard about all the things that have happened there the last few days. What things? Jesus asked. The things that happened to Jesus, the man from Nazareth. They said he was a prophet who did powerful miracles and he was a mighty teacher in the eyes of God and all the people. But our leading priests and other religious leaders handed him over to be condemned to death and they crucified him. We had hoped he was the Messiah who had come to rescue Israel. This all happened three days ago. Then some women from our group of his followers were at his tomb early in the morning and they came back with an amazing report. They said his body was missing and they had seen angels who told them, Jesus is alive. Some of our men ran out to see and sure enough, his body was gone, just as the women had said. Then Jesus said to us, you foolish people, you find it so hard to believe that all the prophets wrote in the scriptures. Wasn't it clearly predicted that the Messiah would have to suffer all these things before entering his glory? Then Jesus took us through the writings of Moses and all the prophets, explaining from all the scriptures the things concerning himself. By this time we were nearing Emmaus and at the end of their journey. Jesus acted as if, as, as if he were going on, but we begged him, stay the night with us since it is getting late. So he went home with us. As we sat down to eat, he took the bread and blessed it. Then he broke it and gave it to them. Suddenly our eyes were opened and we recognised him. At, at that moment, he disappeared. We said to each other, didn't our hearts burn within us as he talked with us on the road and explained the scriptures to us? And within the hour, we were on their way back to Jerusalem. Then we found the 11 disciples and the others who had gathered with them, who said, the Lord has really risen. He appeared to Peter. Our lesson to you this Passover is that you would study the scriptures. Let your heart burn within you as the Holy Spirit guides you in your study of God's word, which all points to the risen Lord Jesus. At dawn on Sunday, the women went to see the tomb. An angel of the Lord had descended from heaven and rolled back the stone. The angel said to the women, do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. 
he is not here, for he has risen.